Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Disassembly Required. As always, I'm your host, Jolene, and today we are going to be talking about sort of an interesting subject. Uh, it's not something I, I see a lot of people talk about in this manner, but I, I have heard a lot of conversations about it in general, especially over the past couple of years. Today we are going to be talking about the cost of realism. Now, what is realism, of course? Well, strictly speaking, in the manner we're going to be referring to it as today, realism is the attempt to make a form of media, whether that be novels, comic books, films, movies, television, whatever, the attempt to make them as real or rather realistic as possible. Now, of course, that's not a controversial topic unto itself. No, no, of course not. Many people enjoy when a novel say, a fantasy novel, is more realistic than the happily ever afters we commonly see in older fairy tales and older fantasy stories, or classical fantasy stories, if you will. However, there is, of course, the difficult concept of how far realism should go. You see, the thing about the distance of realism is that realism can only go so far until what is being presented becomes essentially satire. At a certain point, realism stops being an accurate depiction of this world in realistic circumstances. And instead, it begins to be a satirical and cynical approach to what this world would be like through a modern lens. Now, of course, that seems very broad, you may think, well, of course, I can think of many things that are very realistic or that I would consider realistic or that others have told me. This show or this movie is very realistic. But the thing about it, realism, is it has a misunderstood meaning. Realism in the past say, decade, especially, because the concentration of content is so much more visible through the past decade due to the prevalence of online media, as well as, of course, the accessibility of content in general. Now, it is this new form of realism that has become essentially a new form of satire. It is, it's sort of a circular approach. When satire loses its intentional cynicism and begins to be replaced with genuine cynicism then a, or genuine knowledge and concern about the world, then it begins to transform itself into what, of course, could be called realism. And when realism gains too much cynicism, then that is when realism becomes satire. And there is the unintentional gain of cynicism that we are going to be talking about today. And how this gain of cynicism has led to the difficult situation that we now face. See, many stories and many books, of course, books, novels, 
whatever. Any story in general tends to be presented through the lens of the author. What the author dreams of, envisions, all that wonderful stuff. However, one of the interesting parts about writing in general, whether it's writing for a video game or a short film, a movie, TV show, an author is always inspired by something. And what they are inspired by can be anything. But more commonly than not, and the phrase that m many writers will be familiar with, is write what you know. Knowing something gives you familiarity with it. So when you are writing about it, you feel more comfortable being able to explain situations and the motivations of people, the actions that they take to fulfill their desired outcome. However, the difference that we want to focus on right now is because of the popularity of this realism, what has happened and what has become a more difficult to digest version of realistic entertainment. I want to take you back to the 90s, a time that I'm sure many of you can remember quite well, in fact, whether it was your childhood or even if you grew up in the early 2000s, as 90s content was still quite popular and many series that were popular in the 90s still aired as reruns on whatever network you were watching. Many 90s films were, of course, popular enough to be aired on television. Now, the 90s saw films, especially, let's say, comic book films, as a great example, begin to enter the mainstream. Now, of course, they weren't completely considered mainstream. However, there was enough of a foot in the door that the era of comic books that many people at the time were growing up with or had grown up with were still popular. One known needs to look no farther than the George Clooney Batman movies, Batman Returns and Batman Forever. The, oh God, it slips my mind, but I can't remember exactly which one. In one of them, we get to see our villains, the Riddler and Two-Face, side by side, of course, doing all the deaths of the deeds and whatnot. And of course, they are played quite comedically off of each other, with of course the Riddler being more analogous to what many of us now would consider to be a more Joker-like character, played of course by Jim Carrey. And aside him was a more stoic and hard version of Two-Face. Of course, playing off of each other to a comedic effect as the more colorful and eccentric character of the Riddler was meant to be accentuated against Two-Face. And then, of course, we have the very look of Batman himself. Batman was still very comical. He had a very comic book presence about him. When you saw Batman played by George Clooney on the big screen, he looked almost comical, but not funny in a way. It was a sort of thing where at the moment, if you knew Batman, you would be like, you would see that and you would be 
encouraged in a sense to view that as a ideal version of Batman for the time. If, say, you had grown up in the 80s and read Batman comics when Batman was still a bit... Batman's adventures, of course, were still a bit more on the colorful side. But then, of course, beginning in the 90s, there was the beginning of that realism that began, began to creep into comics. That realism came, of course, alongside hyperviolence, which is, of course, an issue that many people like to concern themselves with, regardless of the accuracy, the incredible accuracy of multiple studies and such. Now, then, years later, as these movies began to grow out of touch, this sort of style began to come out of touch, we enter Batman Begins, a movie that, for many people, created a new, definitive version of Batman. Up until that point, Batman still wore spandex, or latex suit, or rubber. He still could not turn his head in order to see his enemies coming from his side. He had to move his entire person. But then, when Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins film was released, a new, darker version of Batman was shown to the world. A version of Batman who didn't just drive a fancy sports car he named the Batmobile. A version of Batman who didn't wear a spandex or latex suit. This version of Batman drove an armored vehicle equipped with grappling hooks, missile launchers, a detachable motorcycle, and Batman himself, well, he was armed to the teeth. Instead of his clever little arm guards for his gloves, they now were blades meant for close combat damage, ejectable in so by the second film, if I remember correctly, in order, of course, to do ranged damage. The battering was no longer meant for simply disarming foes. It was a method of doing damage. Its sharpened edge meant to be able to pierce opponents. And of course, Batman himself was just the touch, just the touch, more violent because of the world. And because, in, in a justifiable way, at least to the people creating this world, he was more realistic. However, this sort of style was very popular. I mean, this movie essentially began a renaissance of superhero films. I mean, up until then, many people would never have considered an Avengers movie or a Justice League film. But then people began to watch Batman Begins and they said to themselves, I like this. This feels real. This feels like I could see Batman walking down the street one day, or rather one gloomy night. And then of course, with the failure of a brighter movie such as Superman Returns, which stars Brendan Routh, as many of you may, many of you who may be fans of Legends of Tomorrow may recognize as the Atom, and of course a version of Superman 
for the crossover that they had, their adaptation of Crisis on Infinite Earths. If any of you are fans of DC Comics, I would highly recommend that you watch at least their crossovers, the CW show crossovers, because they are a spectacle. Now, as any of us who are familiar with those Batman films from the early 2000s to mid-2010s would know, the Christopher Nolan Batman films were a trilogy. So they went on for long enough to be able to begin to influence how people saw superheroes. Many people who created fantasy and sci-fi are, of course, fans of superheroes. It's very rare that you meet somebody who is only a Star Trek fan or only a Lord of the Rings fan. No, it's, it's usually accompanied by, well, I love Lord of the Rings, but I'm also a huge fan of Superman. Or, Star Trek really gets me in the heart, but you know, sometimes I just really love being able to see Captain America on the big screen throwing his shield at some Nazis. Now, of course, that makes sense. It is a sensible thought to consider that the influence of such a prevalent piece of media would be able to so quickly, in a sense, immerse itself into our culture. I mean, Lord of the Rings had been around for, I believe it was roughly 20 years before it was made into a film. I mean, Batman, of course, was around for about as long as well before he was adapted at all by Adam West's original Batman incarnation, which some of you may might not even recognize that name. <laughs> I just thought about that. Oh. Well, what type of dwell in the past? Time to dwell on... Well, I suppose the past again. <laughs> what I would like to talk about now is uh, um, sort of branching off, in a sense. See, because of the prevalence and popularity of these films, there began to be newer ideas about what this could be, what sci-fi could be, what fantasy could be, what a superhero could be. And of course, a famous graphic novel, The Watchmen, was adapted by the same director to a near critical failure. I should add, but it was still in the same sort of vein as that original Batman movie by Christopher Nolan. It had that same darker tone. However, unlike Batman, The Watchman was intentionally written to be darker. Now, was that film good in any way, shape, or form? Personally, it's a serviceable film, but I would hardly call it an adequate adaptation of The Watchmen. Now, of course, I'm not here to debate adequate adaptations and all that, no. I'm here to speak about resurgences. You see, the Lord of the Rings, obviously, was very popular throughout the late 90s and early 2000s with the trilogy going on. And as that trilogy ended and the Batman trilogy began to flourish, 
someone somewhere as they watched the dark knight rises said what if we could make a fantasy show that's dark and brutal and and realistic of all things like this like this batman movie what if we could make a a good realistic fantasy show and so someone at HBO said give me a script and you're hired and years later now we have Game of Thrones Game of Thrones of course as we all know lasted for eight seasons and similar to Christopher Nolan's Watchmen film ended in critical failure. Now, what is the importance of just a simple show like Game of Thrones? Well, Game of Thrones was like finding the key to a gate that should not be opened. Because, you see, George R. R. Martin and the other creative leads of the show, George R. R. Martin, for those of you who might not know, is the author of the original Game of Thrones novels. And, of course, all the preceding Game of Thrones novels. However, uh, he did not have a hand in certain seasons due to his novels not being able to... <laughs> Oh, excuse me, I seem to have caught a case of the hiccups. Due to his novels not being able to keep up with the show. But Game of Thrones, those first two seasons, and the renewal for a third and possibly fourth season, showed people that you can make a show that is incredibly reprehensible. Because you see, Game of Thrones was not realistic. It took that simple idea of realism, that idea that was presented in the, in the Christopher Nolan Batman films. It took that idea and ran in the wrong direction with it. You see, I am not saying that Game of Thrones is not a fantasy series, or I'm not saying really anything about the series in any sort of negative or positive way. Well, I suppose maybe I am. It could be construed as such at the very least. But the thing about Game of Thrones is it took that idea of realism and it attempted to mold it into something that was a more perfect form. It was sort of how with each new version of Batman there are newer ideas put onto him. It seems almost as if each new version, at least in the films of Batman, would get a more violent Batman, which I would love to do an episode about another time, because I would like to talk about the psychology of that and the effects of that as well. However, I'm not here to discuss that. It attempted to mold that idea of realism into something that could fit for fantasy. However, it took that realism and pushed it to such an extreme that it became almost satire. Now, of course, I don't expect to change any minds here, and I don't expect that any fans of Game of Thrones would be willing to lay down their hands and hands off their keyboards, of course, and say, well, you know what? I agree with you. 
Game of Thrones went too far. Because the way that G Game of Thrones was represented, it was created to draw you in into a line of thought, suspend your disbelief, of course, but in a way that made you almost a part of the show. And what do I mean by that? Because that's a very broad phrasing. What I mean by that is, in a way, it made you feel as if this could be a real world. And of course, this can be done in a lot of stories by adding minor details, really just considerations about the direction of your story. However, this minor consideration, or rather these collections of minor considerations, were used to create something almost monstrous in a sense. Because you see, the creators of Game of Thrones did not have the same idea of realism or the, rather any real idea of realism. To them, realism meant a brutal world in which everyone is constantly trying to get ahead, constantly stepping over anyone in their way. A world completely devoid of the capability or even the thought of compassion. A world in which you can read into any horrific amount of subtext you might like. You see, the thing about Game of Thrones that nobody wants to talk about is its methods of violence. You see, the use of violence is very important when considering realism. Because, while to some, violence can be analogous with realism, it is not meant to be a partner to realism, nor is it meant to substitute realism. However, violence corrupted this form of realism. If you were to use a baking analogy, you might have accidentally thrown in some salt instead of some sugar while making a cake. Because you see, the use of violence is a lot like the use of sugar. Too little, in some cases of course, and a story can feel contrived or dry. Too much, and it becomes unpalatable. I mean, a dry cake is better than one that hurts your teeth because it is too sweet. But the interesting part about all of this is that because of the popularity of this new form of realism, this fake form of realism, a faux realism, if you will, because of this popularity of Game of Thrones and the door that was opened by the Batman trilogy, Fantasy became a new realm, a new home for the most horrific acts people can imagine. For instance, during the run of Game of Thrones, a new show was put out on AMC, The Walking Dead. Now, of course, 
Much of The Walking Dead isn't, inc isn't incredibly violent, however, it has enough violence that many people are still drawn to it. Unlike Game of Thrones, it isn't as sweet to further that analogy, but it is more well written considering the characters and such. Years later, or not even years later actually, around roughly the same time we get the show Breaking Bad, a darker take on, on the world, but a take that informed the public conscious. Again later we get another show which for many years people had said was unadaptable, something that would simply be unable to be aired on television or at the very least had very little chance of being ever aired on television. Preacher, a comic book, or rather a graphic novel by Garth Ennis, if I remember correctly, correct me if I am wrong, let me know in the comments. I do like to be corrected when I am wrong because that way I can avoid future mistakes. Back on the topic at hand. This graphic novel by Garth Ennis features the story of a preacher who is given a power that made God fear his job. It made God essentially give up being God. Now, of course, that seems strange. However, it isn't necessarily a difficult concept to understand. It's fairly simple, and some would even argue that it is realistic, given the state of the world and all that. However, the difficulty comes when one considers the implementation of that idea. Because, you see, it wasn't simply a high fantasy story about meeting angels and discovering faith again. No, instead, this was a story of a dark world. A place where people did horrible things to each other and a place that was devoid, again, of that compassion. Compassion, however, is of course present because we must have that simple touch of it. But it is reserved for choice moments. Dare I say, it is faintly, rarely sprinkled in. And when doing so, it is only reserved for the characters that you are supposed to feel for. The main characters, of course. But, when considering all this, one must look at how influential that idea of a lack of compassion was. Because, of course, Game of Thrones, it's really not a stretch to say that Game of Thrones is influential on the, the world of fantasy. In fact, I know many people who got into fantasy because of Game of Thrones. Now, am I upset with them for liking Game of Thrones? Of course not. However, I found it interesting to hear things that they had to say when they originally got into fantasy, and of course how their opinions of the 
original thing that got them into the subject have changed. Because, you see, lacking that emotion of compassion is what many would consider a crucial flaw. It is something that, if you are to define how, how a piece of media would fail, you would use a lack of compassion for characters in their world as a defining trait. However, with Game of Thrones and with subsequent more realistic quote-unquote interpretations of fantasy, we are given a fake compassion as well. Fake compassion for fake realism. <laughs> This fake compassion is interesting because it invites us to attempt to think like the character we would normally wish to feel compassion for. The character who, f for instance, may be trying to protect their family or serve their country. Noble causes, more often than not. However, in this context, they carry a more sinister tone, which might sound absurd. You might say, well, how can defending your own family be considered absurd? This fake compassion, while some may simply consider it to be the actions of a heartless human being, others may very clearly recognize everything that these characters with this faux compassion trait, they may recognize their actions as textbook abusive behavior. Specifically, of course, interpersonal relationships, occasionally in certain depictions, it can be relationship-wise, but I'm speaking simply on a broader spectrum. Now you see, this is important because this manipulation that these characters use, by replacing compassion with manipulation, it is no longer, woe is me. It is no longer, I have done good and been punished. It is, I have done horrible things and have been punished. Feel bad for me. It is a sort of, wary is the head that decapitates itself. Many times, these characters are the specific ones who are set up, in a sense, as the tragic heroes or the tragic characters. You're supposed to have felt for them and hear their stories and think to yourself, I could have been that. That could have been me. But in these stories, their actions tend to be so horrific. Their reasonings so twisted and far beyond what most people would consider even remotely reasonable, that for many it would not even be a consideration to align themselves with the morals of these characters. But by using this manipulation not only as a character trait, but as a way to characterize your story, people fell into the trap that the characters of the story are falling into. They fell into the, the trap of sympathy for someone who has done horrible things and feels no real remorse. That, of course, is a broad statement. 
But given the circumstances, a broad statement can be made because I would dare anybody who has found a more realistic form of media over the past couple of years, I would dare them to pick any character that one would be able to say is abusive and attempt to refute that. Because using a real psychological analysis, one can very easily determine this behavior. And I actually would love to go into this topic another day. Uh, I think about it. I'm writing these side topics down. <laughs> so, Preacher, Game of Thrones. Of course, these were quite violent, but nothing insanely horrible. Well, no, they were quite insanely horrible, now that I reconsider my words. <laughs> However, Preacher opened the door for another series, one that, if perhaps you've seen my other channel, Heaven's Door, I don't really post videos on there anymore. I used to do video gaming and uh, talks about shows I had watched. Um, if, you, if any of you happen to be familiar with that channel, you might recognize my next subject, The Boys. Now, The Boys is a TV show released oh, a year ago now. Roughly a year ago, I believe. Correct me on that if I am wrong. But it was released a year ago. And up until then, for many, it was in an even further range than Preacher. While Preacher, some considered to be unadaptable, there were still some who had thought, well, maybe if we change this and we rearrange that, perhaps we can make the more palatable. We can add more sugar to this cake. <laughs> However, that was not a consideration for the adaptation of Garth Anus's next work, The Boys. No, The Boys was something that was considered very widely to be incredibly unadaptable because of the incredible nature of violence the horrific murders and mutilations, the rampant sexual assaults in the, in the novel. I will not go into detail about any of it, but it is very, as much of Garth Ingus's work is, emotionally charged with self-imposed ideology it very much considers a certain world view to be the only acceptable one. Now, I very much love to debate Garth Ennis on this topic. If I'm being correct in remembering who the author of, this, of these works is, I would very much like to speak to him and get his thoughts on the prevalence of the uses of violence and the increase of uses of um, sexual themes and sexual assaults in more realistic films and realistic quote unquote I'm doing very big very obvious Dr. Evil style air quotes <laughs> but I, I would love to speak with them on this topic because it is very rare that you really hear someone be able to essentially justify these ideas that they are presenting. Now, am I saying that these people are horrible people? No, of course not. But I'm simply saying that they are attempting to do something which, for all intents and purposes, has been out of their reach for a very long time. You are essentially, essentially these people who have been creating realism and perpetuating this idea of realism, they have been 
trying to bake a cake with plastic ingredients. I would find it very hard if I was them to attempt to bake a cake using a plastic bag of flour that of course is hollow on the inside, such as a children's toy for visual aid. However, for some, this cake, this melted amalgamation of plastic, is palatable. Dare I say to some, it is a refreshing change of pace. It is a new flavor that they haven't been able to experience, and it is a flavor that they welcome with open arms. But that is because they do not consider the ramifications of what this means. I mean, if a plastic cake became a new fad, and you went into a bakery and simply walked up to the counter and said, I would like to order a wedding cake, please, or I would like a cake for my sibling's birthday, and they hand you a large, hollow, plastic piece of cake, you would look at them and say, are you out of your mind? Did I walk into the wrong store? Because, of course, this is not realism. Just like a children's plastic version of cake is not cake. However, people have tricked themselves into believing that because something contains violence, and because something contains brutality and assault, because something does not only contain, but highlights and accentuates the worst possible features of humanity, that it is inherently correct and it is inherently realistic, which is a flawed mentality to say the least, and an incorrect and reprehensible philosophy for any form of fantasy or sci-fi at all. This horrific realism is what, for many people, ruins the new Star Trek series, both Star Trek Picard and Star Trek Discovery, because they do not attempt to grasp the full meaning of what Star Trek is. They do not attempt to read the very specific ingredient list and the very specific recipe for this cake. No, they insist on making it themselves with an amalgamation of real and fake ingredients and what they hand you is a poisoned mess that you are almost compelled to eat because of your love for the original recipe. But the moment that the smell of this new dish hits your nose, you are repulsed. Because who would, in their right mind, eat something as disgusting as a plastic cake? Well, I suppose a lot of people would, given my analogies and the popularity of the series I'm speaking about, I suppose a lot of people would. Now, do I expect this form of realism to die out anytime soon? It's hard to say. Many people who are currently working in the entertainment industry lack the drive to be able to create new ideas. And so, as a result, we get remakes, rehashings of the same concepts, same intellectual properties, same ideas, but of course with a new coat of paint. And 
I'm not sure there are truly enough people who are willing to really say, this isn't good. This isn't edible, to further my analogy. I don't think, especially with the popularity of the boys and the popularity of darker takes on newer intellectual properties or older ones, more classic ones, I don't think that this realism will die out anytime soon. And that is a sad fact because this form of realism is poison. The entertainment industry is ingesting this cake made of very toxic plastic that was baked in an oven at 400 degrees for 45 minutes. And the more the entertainment industry eats this cake, the more it willingly poisons itself. Because by the time it becomes apparent that realism is going out of style, it may very well kill the popularity of a lot of these IPs. That is why I believe that Marvel, at least for the time being, has become so successful. Because they perform a more accurate form of realism. Which is a great way to look at this. They perform the classic stories of superheroes, but in a more realistic world. Now, is this realistic world dark and brutal and are people murdered every 10 minutes and women and children constantly assaulted? No. This is a world in which a billionaire playboy philanthropist learns that he's not the center of the universe and grows and becomes friends with a man who he himself said everything special about him came out of a test tube. A world in which we can get a tragic character who can grow and become something more than the sum of his original parts. A a character who, in a sense, evolves, which is what a story is supposed to be. In many of these stories, there is no evolution. There is just, in, in, these, in this faux realism, characters are relegated to an idea, and that idea is everything about that character. Nothing about that idea can change because that would mean that character would have to change. And that is too much work for the people who create these characters. Because they don't want a complex story. They don't want something that is truly real. They want a fake, they want a cardboard cutout of realism. They want something that they can present as real while filling it with their own ideas and filling it with their own concepts of what the world is while completely ignoring everything contradictory to that idea. Many of these stories that involve realism are entirely Eurocentric. They entirely focus on white people, especially straight white people. I mean, I would even think Game of Thrones has a person of color in the entire cast. And they ran for eight years. I mean, The Witcher just premiered last Christmas. Well, no, not on Christmas. But like last December, January-ish. I can't really remember, but I know it was over winter break last Christmas time. You get the idea. And they have more, more people of color in that show than in like 
literally the entirety of Game of Thrones. <laughs> like, it is absolutely insane to think just how simplistic this idea is, and just how much it is meant to only represent a certain idea, whether consciously or subconsciously, about how the world is, and about who people are, and who humanity is. I mean, <coughs> excuse me, it, it is incredibly obvious when you watch some of these shows, in a sense, how how it, what the word, of course, is, is racist. How really racist this idea of humanity is because it only considers how white people view the world and how white people are affected by superheroes being real or by the advent of space travel or this, that, and the other goddamn thing. It does not consider the experience of any form of person of color, of anyone who isn't straight, of anyone whose gender does not conform to the binary. whose gender is not, of course, analogous with their sex. These people do not represent all of humanity, and neither does this form of realism. Because in order for something to truly be real, it must represent a whole picture. Say, for instance, you were to only see the famous Mona Lisa. Imagine you only saw that picture with just the small part of her hands. And the Mona Lisa to you was only the hands of this woman. The crossed hands sitting on her lap and nothing else. No background, just the pure black abyss of hands sitting upon a black dress. Now that would do an incredible injustice to such a work of art. But, to be able to view the whole painting, or to be able to take in the whole picture, is something that gives you a better idea about what the painting is. When you first know it, if you who've only seen it as hands, you do not consider whose hands they might be. Or rather, you can only consider, say, whose hands they might be. Is this a man? Is it a woman? Where are these hands coming from? Are they shaking hands? Are they joined? Is this a marriage? Is this a, a symbol of love piercing through the dark, or of oneself being able to find its true meaning. These are the questions that have no real bearing on the whole work of art because they are not what the work is. Humanity is not just the painting of hands in a black abyss. Humanity is a painting of a 14th century woman sitting in front of the, in the Italian countryside, staring at one of the strangest inventors of <laughs> European history, a man who thought that he could fly across Italy <laughs> using a rickety glider made of wood and leather.
it is to take in the whole picture to realize humanity and to be able to create true realism. Now, can you really create realism while only knowing so little of the world? I guess that's what I'll leave you off on today. Thank you all for coming. If indeed you're still here. And I will catch you all next time.